There are many fears and phobias that fill our culture, our world, and some fear is healthy, right? Some fear even prote protects us. My fear of falling off of a building keeps me safe, you know, when I'm up on my roof blowing out my leaves. But fear can also be debilitating. It can stop us from living the life that we're supposed to live. And so this series, Fear Less, is exploring how we can, uh, you know, fear these things less and live more the life that Jesus has called us to live. Today's session is entitled, The Fear of Missing Out. The Fear of Missing Out. I've read some of your fears. I solicited them this week on Facebook. And I read some of your fears of missing out, church. There was fears about missing moments with your kids. Uh, some of you working moms posted on this. What if, what if they take, and, and dads feel it too, what if they take their first steps and you're at work or they do something and you're just missing the time because you're spending it at work? Some are, miss, are fear missing messages when you're away from church. Or I had one dear sweet student that said missing youth group, you know, she fears missing youth group. And she should fear missing youth group. No, I'm just... <laughs> Uh, what, if, what if the message that was shared was exactly what I needed to hear that Sunday morning? There's an answer to that. Just be here every Sunday, right, Randy? I mean, that should settle it. <laughs> no fear. There you go. We've knocked that one out. Let's move along. There's also just the fear of missing an opportunity that God sends your way because you were too busy to notice it and to jump on it. There's actually an abbreviation for this fear of missing out. It's called FOMO. FOMO, that's with an F, FOMO, and it's, of course, it stands for fear of missing out. This term, you, if you look it up, it might be uh, the fear that grips you if you feel like you're missing out on the insider information. You know, why do, why do my coworkers, why do they have the inside track on this, but I feel like I'm always on the outside? Or maybe missing out on the group gossip. You know, why am I not in on the, the latest juicy details? Um, it could be missing out on, you know, uh, uh, an event. You're stuck here, but you're just, you're convinced that something more exciting is going on somewhere else. I know you don't feel that now, because here you are at church listening to Chris Bordeaux. So, come on. <laughs> Thanks for a, a pity woohoo. I appreciate that very much. Um, on social media, the, this a hashtag FOMO is used in a lot of different ways. Jealous of not being out with friends. Your friends are posting pictures of a good time they're having, but you're stuck at work, and so you post how you're, you're jealous about that, missing out. Even uh, companies like McDonald's are using this hashtag FOMO in their ad campaigns. Like, don't, don't suffer from the fear of missing out. Get our chicken nuggets. You know, that, so it's even big companies are, are jumping on this. It might even be used to explain... Uh, why you went into debt to buy the latest iPhone. You know, fear of missing out. I didn't want to miss out on the new. I'm not sure what it does new, but I definitely don't want to miss it. And so, yeah, take my credit card. Uh, I've even seen some parents that uh, appeal to FOMO when their kids just will not go to sleep at night. They're frustrated and they're tired and the kids are just whining like Xander here had an early case of fear of missing out would not go to bed even though I was tired and frustrated. Just take your nap. I didn't shake him violently. No calling, no calling child protective service on me, guys. But you know, the, these are maybe some silly examples, but fear of missing out goes a lot deeper, a lot deeper when it comes to the Christian life. Many wonder if I follow Jesus wholeheartedly, if I really you know, follow his plan for my life, will I miss out on all the fun? Am I going to miss out on the good things that my friends who aren't worried about what Jesus thinks are doing? It might keep a, a person from even becoming a Christ follower, a Christian, in the first place. You have the single college age guy. He's decided, I'm going to live a pure life for Jesus. I'm going to abstain from sex or living with my girlfriend until I'm married. But he sees all his buddies going out and sleeping around, and he's wondering, am I missing out? 
a newlywed couple decides that, hey, at the beginning of our marriage, we are going to give our tithes and offerings to the Lord. We're going to commit 10% off at least right off the top. But then they see their other friends who are getting married and they're buying newer cars than them because maybe they don't have that priority of following the Lord in that way. They're wondering, are we missing out? There might be a young girl, teenage girl, that wants to stand up for life, wants desperately to, to share or post that meme about pro-life, but she knows her friends are, are liberal and they're pro-choice and she's just going to get ostracized. What if, what if they don't talk to me anymore and I miss out on those relationships? Or maybe the retired couple that wants to commit regularly to church ministry, and they do, but they see other couples their age that are retired and traveling the world all the time, and here they're, they have this regular commitment in their hometown, at their local church. Am I missing out on all the adventures I could be having because I'm here following Jesus' will for me? Well, today we're going to catch up with Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. Turn your Bibles to chapter 9 in the Gospel of Luke. And here Jesus is calling people to be his disciple and along the way, he's addressing their fear of missing out, their FOMO. You're not going to like me saying that. Some of you are just, I just don't like that abbreviation. Maybe in print, but not out loud. I don't know. The older you are, the less you like me saying that, probably. And that's fair. That's fair. But let's dive in as Jesus is addressing this. In verse 23, that's where we're going to pick it up. And this is the only time I'm going to ask you to read along today. All right? So really give it all you got here when we get to the yellow print, all right? This is Jesus talking. It says, Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. He put it right on the line, right up front. If anyone wants to be my disciple, here's what they need to do. Deny themselves Take up their cross daily and follow me. Jesus says plainly that being his disciple is going to cost you greatly. It's going to cost you greatly. Even your life. This is before Jesus himself went to the cross. But imagine, imagine his his. This, these crowds sitting around him knowing about the Romans and how they crucified people, how humiliating that was, how painful it was, how life-ending it was. They see these, these, these crosses and these people up on these crosses. They shield their children's eyes when they are going along the road where these crucifixions have happened. And Jesus says, that's the kind of life that you could be headed for when you're my disciple. Well, the Gospels record when Jesus started talking like this to the crowds, that the crowds thinned out. And that probably doesn't surprise us. Because people were worried about missing out on all the good things life has to offer. Jesus said, come be my disciple and you're going to get all kinds of bad things. And the crowds started to wane a little when he started talking like this. But he was being up front. Well, today we're going to dive into this this passage, and we're going to discover three keys to overcoming the fear of missing out. You're going to want to write them down there on your outline. The first one that Jesus says to us is this, to deny yourself. Deny yourself. Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. Now, many, many would like to fit Jesus into their lives, right? I'm going to live my own life, you know, my way, my goals, my hopes and dreams, but I'm going to bring Jesus into it. I believe he's Lord. I believe he died for me. I'm going to fit Jesus into my life sometimes, sometimes. But Jesus says to his disciples that we need to deny our whole lives, our whole selves, that we need to deny those hopes and those plans and those dreams and those agendas. We need to turn them in and say, not my will, what we were singing, right? Not my will, but yours be done. He says, out of the gate, to be my disciple, you got you to gotta write a quick claim deed and turn it over and say, hey, it's all yours now. 
your will, your agenda, your hopes, your dreams for my life, Jesus. For many Christians, that's just too tall an order. We want to live our own lives. Maybe we'll clean it up a little bit, behave a little bit less naughty, fit Jesus in where it makes sense, where it's convenient for us, but living our our Christian life this way, it leads to two big reoccurring problems. If you just try to fit Jesus into what you've already got going on, here's two things that you can expect. Number one, we're never, if we do this, we're never going to, there's nothing to write down, but you could, we're never going to experience all that Jesus has planned for our lives. All the ways that the kingdom of God could advance through us, all the hopes and dreams Jesus has for us, these things are going to be stifled and maybe not even happen if we're just simply fitting in some occasional Jesus tasks. Sometimes I'll do what Jesus wants. No, you're going to miss out on everything that he has planned for you. The second thing that'll happen is those times where you muster up enough, you know, guilt because Randy was really pounding you one uh, Sunday, and so finally you're guilty enough to do something Jesus wants you to do, you are always going to fear missing out on what you'd rather be doing. Fine, I'll come to church on Sunday, even though it's a gorgeous Sunday and Saturday was raining and I just want to enjoy the changing colors and get these leaves finally off of my property. I'll come to church anyway, but you fear missing out. Fine, I'll share my faith with my neighbor even though it's going to make things really awkward, and I'd rather just have fun talking with my neighbor around the barbecue or over the fence or something, but now it's going to get weird. Fine, I'll do it, but you feel like you're missing out. Fine, I'll help that person who, you know, needs help this Saturday. Even though it's my day off, I'll go and help that person out. You'll always feel that way. This type of disciple is always going to be wrestling with FOMO, with the fear of missing out because, because he or she has not truly exchanged their own agenda, their own life for Jesus's. But Jesus says, deny yourself to truly live for him. When we exchange our plans for our lives, for his plans, for our, when we turn in and say, it's not about me anymore, Jesus. It's about what you want for my life. Now, all the things that Jesus calls you to do They're not distractions from living your life. They're pouring into the life that you're supposed to live. It's exciting, engaging, encouraging. Even the hard things are like, yeah, I'm getting this done because this is the life I'm supposed to be living. But if we haven't checked it in, if we haven't traded in our will for his, if we haven't denied ourselves in the get-go, then those things seem like a distraction and a chore. Totally changes how we feel about those things. I've seen it in my life when I was about 21 years ago. 21 years ago tomorrow, I put my trust in Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I was a senior in high school, and I was sure of what I was going to do with the rest of my life. I was going to go off to an art university. I was going to draw for Disney. I was going to live in California, and I was going to surf with a bunch of babes. That's all I wanted to do as a senior in high school. Oh, and I had a band. that I wanted to bring them out there with me so I could be really cool playing guitar. I was sure I wanted to do that, but none of those things are what Jesus had planned for me. I turned in my life to him, I stayed in Michigan, and I focused on reaching other people for Christ, because that's what he called me to do. You're not all called to be a pastor, that's what he called me to do. And I totally gave up on all that. And I can say from my experience that the, the joy that has come has, has blown me away, blown me away. Of course, I'm married to Leah, she's awesome, with a little A, she's not God, but you know, she's awesome, like, awesome dude. Sorry I'd explain that so much. <laughs> I got two wonderful kids who I love, and, and everything that I'm doing, yeah, there's a lot of hard work. There, you know, there's still trials. There's still hurts and stuff in life. I'm not saying, you know, Jesus, Jesus said he calls you to pick up a cross, not a cushion, right? And so there's been struggles, but everything that I get to do, I get to pour into Jesus' will for my life. I'm not always perfect at that. I'm not. When I'm doing it, man, I'm, I'm getting that joy that comes for living my life. But it starts off with denying ourselves. I was looking at some pictures last week, and these gems came up. Uh, These are some, uh, a couple of years ago, a bunch of friends and family came over on a couple of occasions, actually, and helped me to move a deck. 
uh, somebody was getting rid of their pool, their above ground pool and their deck, big giant heavy deck, and said, if I could just get it out, I could have it for free. And I thought, oh, this could be great for my family, great for the youth group parties coming over. Um, but I had to call some people together because I'm not strong enough to carry a pool and a deck on my back. And so we got a ton of people came over and helped out. These are just some pictures, and there's a lot of people that helped that aren't pictured, so I apologize to you. Uh, but even like Tom Phipps brought over his tractor and even was crazy enough to let me drive it and operate it for a little bit. Uh, brought over his trailer so we could haul this deck from where we were picking it up to our house. And then they came back the year after, and Chuck Minkowski helped me dig these post holes and taught me how to pour concrete and set posts to get this in. It was a huge ask. I, I felt blown away. I thought, who am I that I can ask this of these people? You know, who am I that they would take a, away a couple of Saturdays to come out and help me do this? But they, you know, they did it. They're friends. They love me, and I appreciate it. Every time I'm swimming in that pool, or every time we have a, a youth group pool party at our house, I'm just overwhelmed with gratitude all over again for these people that sacrificed to, to come and do this. This was a big deal. You know, I didn't pay them. I think I might have got pizza, but that was about it, you know. But Jesus isn't just asking us to help move a deck, all right? Jesus isn't just asking that. He's calling us to deny our whole lives. What we had planned doesn't matter anymore if it's not what Jesus had planned. And so the question is, as I wondered, who am I that these guys would come and help me with the deck? Who is Jesus that he has the right to ask us to deny ourselves and follow him? I wonder if the crowds wondered that. Well, that leads to our, our second point here on the outline, our second key to overcoming the fear of missing out, and it's to follow Jesus. Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple must follow me. And that, of course, follow Jesus brings up two questions. Number one, who is he that we should follow him? Who is this guy with the boldness to ask us to give up our own lives, our own selves, our own plans, our own hopes, our own dreams for him? And what does it mean to follow him? When he says, follow me, what does that mean for us? And so let's back up a little bit in the passage. You back up a little in chapter 9. And just before we're about to read in verse 21 is where we'll pick it up. The disciples had just put their finger on Jesus' identity. That he is the Messiah. That he's the Son of God. That he was the promised one that God was sending into the world to save his people. And then look what it says in verse 21. This is backing it up a little before Jesus' call that we've already read. It says, Jesus strictly warned them, his disciples, okay? He's just speaking privately with them. He warned them not to tell anyone. Not to tell anyone that they found out he's the Messiah, he's the Son of God. And then he goes on, he says, it says, and then he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. He must be killed and on the third day raised to life. And so Jesus lays out the plan. He recognized, you're right, I am the Messiah, I'm the Son of God, I'm God in the flesh. But don't tell anybody that. And then he tells them what's going to happen to the Son. And so when it reads, as you move along in the chapter, it says, then he said to them all, now Jesus has turned to the crowds. Crowds didn't hear what Jesus said. Jesus just said, I'm going to die and be raised to life. I'm going to die for you and I'm going to be raised to life. But he turned to the crowds and he says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. These people are left with the question, who are you to ask us to do that? Jesus has been teaching with authority. Jesus has been performing miracles. They, they know something special is going on with Jesus. But his main display of his identity and power, the resurrection, so far has only been talked about and in secret among his close disciples. And so Jesus is kind of like the opposite of an infomercial, isn't he? Think of an infomercial that you've seen. You know, the infomercial is like, you get these beautiful knives. All right, look at these beautiful knives. <laughs> I don't know if I can keep that up for very long, so let's go back to my Canadian-American accent. Uh, along with these, these uh, knives, you also get these eight special knives. And, and you're going to get the carrying case. But wait, there's even more, guys. If you order right now, you'll get this super sweet chopping block and a personal jet pack, all for the low, low price of 19, three easy payments, sorry, of 
95. Jesus doesn't work like that. I'll be honest, I'm tempted to treat Jesus like that. The church is tempted to treat Jesus like that, you know? I, I'm tempted to say, all right, listen, guys, you're going to get the eternal life. You're going to get the joy. You're going to get the peace. But wait for it. There's even more. If you act now, you will get God's directions for your life, his blessings, and this free Contigo coffee mug. <laughs> Ooh, that one, hit, that one hit home a little bit. <laughs> Might have gone too far. Jesus... Jesus doesn't do it this way. He doesn't do it this way at all. Jesus says, deny yourself, pick up a cross, be willing to be humiliated and killed, and follow me. And then Jesus looks around to see who's left, who's stuck around to listen, to find out if it was worth it. So who is Jesus and what did he do? Well, Jesus, according to the Bible, guys, is God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, the one who loves you, the one who created you because he wanted to create you and he wanted you to be here, the one who knows how you work best. That's who Jesus is. He became a human being, wrapped himself in flesh to reveal what God is like so we'd have no question who God is and what he's like. And then, just as he said to his disciples in this passage, he was humiliated for us. He was beaten for us. He died on the cross for us. The Bible teaches when he died on the cross, not only did he die that physical death, but he suffered separation from God the Father in our place. The Bible teaches our sin uh, earned us separation from God, but Jesus took that separation. He denied himself all his glory, all his majesty as God Almighty to, became, to become a person, and not just to become a person, but to suffer separation from God the Father in our place. And so the one who asks us to deny ourselves is the one who first denied himself for us. Jesus is no do as I say, not as I do. He did everything he calls us to do and infinitely more when he died on the cross. Following Jesus does mean giving up our lives to him, but it's, it's exactly what he did for us. But here's the thing. Jesus didn't stop there. Jesus didn't stop with dying for us. He came back to life. When he, it's, he said the, that the Son of Man will suffer and will die, but will also be raised to life. These disciples saw that. They saw the resurrected Jesus, and, and it proved, it proved that he is who he claimed to be, God Almighty, that he did what he claimed to do, beat death for all who follow him. And so Jesus calls us to deny ourselves and follow him because of, of who he is. He's the creator that loves us. He's the one who first denied himself for us, trading glory to be separate from the Father so that we could be with him forever. But when we follow Jesus... When we follow Jesus, we don't just follow him to death. We follow him to life, real life, resurrection. You're fearing missing out on the good time? I got bad news for you. You will miss out on some good time here on earth. Jesus doesn't care about offending you with that. He lets you know it's going to happen from the beginning. But what he's promising, if you follow me in that, you get to follow me also into life. That's who we're following. And this leads us to our third, our last item on the list, for over, the key to overcoming fear of missing out, and that is to focus on the goal. Focus on the goal. Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple must take up their cross daily. The moment we lay down our lives and trust in Jesus as Lord, that means God Almighty and Savior. That means the one who paid the penalty for us on the cross to save us from hell, to give us eternal life. When we trust in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we become a Christ follower. We're in relationship with Jesus and we're heaven bound. But Jesus tells us that daily we're going to need to pick this cross back up when we follow him. And that suggests 
that each day is going to continue to be a challenge for us. To deny ourselves and to follow Jesus, it's going to be hard. Every day is going to be hard. Not just the day you decided to trust in Jesus. Every day we need to keep our eyes on that goal that Jesus is calling us to. The passage goes on. Look in verse 24. It reads, this is Jesus talking to the crowds. And he says, whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. The goal of Jesus' disciples' life, the goal of our lives as Jesus' disciple is an ever-deepening relationship with our Lord. That's the goal of our life, to continue to grow in relationship and knowledge of Jesus and the Father. That's what we're doing here on earth. That's what eternity is. It's like a, a man who gets married and he trades in his single life, his bachelor life for a family, but it's, it's even deeper with Jesus. We're, we're trading in our lives, which have an ending point, which we're leading to death without him. And we're trading it in for him and a relationship with him that will go on forever. We long for that day when we walk into eternity and Jesus is proud to receive us where he says, well done, where he doesn't distance himself from us, but, but runs to us, that imagery. But this world certainly does offer a lot of distractions along the way, a lot of pitfalls, pitfalls that could trip us up. It's, I'm going to get a little intimate with you guys here, a little transparent with you guys here. Uh, it's like giving up cheese melted on bread after 8 o'clock at night. Sounds weirdly specific, right? It's because I'm talking from my heart here, my experience. To trade that kind of junk food in order to, to get fit. All right? I, my, my grandpa died from a heart attack when he was 49 years old. Very young man. I love my, my grandpa. I miss my grandpa. Uh, my kids never got to meet him. My dad almost died at the same age from a heart attack. And so Leah reminds me regularly that my lifestyle needs to be different from theirs. If I want to be fit and healthy, to see boys grow up, to become dads. And so th there's those nights where, you know, I'm like, man, but I really, really want to melt some cheese on something. <laughs> and in those moments, I need to focus on the goal. My goal in this case is that I don't want my kids to one day describe me to their kids who I never meet as, well, yeah, we miss your grandpa, we loved your grandpa, but boy, did he love his cheese fries. Boy, did he love his melted cheese on bread. I don't want that. What I want is to be fit. I want to wrestle with my grandkids. I want to get there and be fit for them. And not just for them, but for my wife, for the ministry that God has called me to, for everything. And so I, I focus on the goal when that temptation comes. Sometimes I make it, sometimes I give in, okay? You're looking at me, and I get it, I get it, I get it. <laughs> Daily picking up your cross for Jesus is like that, but infinitely more. Infinitely more. The goal that we are being called to is not a six-pack of abs, all right? The goal we're calling, being called to is not just maybe another decade of life, and feeling healthier. The goal we're being called to is eternity in heaven and the reward that God gives us when we get there. According to the Bible, we, we can barely even understand how awesome heaven is. What Jesus, the life that he's called us to, we can't even fully grasp that. We did a series about heaven, and I'm going to plagiarize Randy Ream right here. He said, I'm just, you know, quoting him because I'm going to get to a racy statement here in a minute. He said, our greatest pleasures on earth, the wholesome ones and even, even the sinful ones, even 
the greatest pleasure, euphoric feeling we can get from sin. Yes, Randy did say that. They're temporary, and they're imperfect. They never fully satisfy. Wholesome, sinful, doesn't matter. But they're not supposed to. See, God designed those things to whet our appetite for heaven, for what he has in store waiting for us. The best that earth can offer only points toward what Jesus has called us to. And so what that means is if we can keep our focus on that reunion with Jesus in heaven, where he doesn't say, I'm ashamed of you, but instead embraces you and says, well done, I love you, welcome to your reward, welcome to heaven. If we long for that day, then whatever we face in this life, however good or however bad, we know we can get through it. We know we can keep it up. Because it doesn't matter compared to what we're going toward. Jesus says, don't waste your time on earth living for yourself. He said it's the only way to guarantee that you'll miss out. Whoever wants to save their life is going to lose it. The only way to guarantee you're going to miss out is to try not to miss out. Reminds me of an article I read. It's by author Matt Walsh. He can sometimes be provocative and make people upset, but I like what he had to say in this article here. Uh, the, the article title is pretty funny. It's entitled, If You Want to Be a Miserable Failure, Just Do What Makes You Happy. <laughs> like I said, he pushes a lot of people's buttons. And he writes in, in this article, he says, We live today in a society filled with happy, optimistic, positive-thinking, joyless, miserable, lonely, smiling, empty people. They've settled for mere happiness, and even that, they rarely find it. If only they'd aimed a little higher. The whole article is actually very well written. And he challenges people to, instead of seeking what makes them happy in life, seek God's will for their life, seek real joy that comes from following God, seek what's virtuous and right, do the right thing, not the happy thing. And if it means missing out on some temporary happiness, he says it's worth it. And I think he's right on. Remember what awaits us as we follow Christ. If we've denied our lives to follow him, and if we pick up that cross daily, remember that it's worth it. It's worth public shame as you stand for Christ on social media or in the workplace or wherever God has planted you. It's worth rejection from those around you if that's what comes. It's worth cutting sin out of your life that you really love. It's worth cutting it out. It's even worth death. You know, that's something that we don't worry too much about here in Michigan. But we have brothers and sisters overseas that are facing death. That, that's a reality that they could die today, every day that they wake up because of their faith in Christ. But Jesus is not going to be ashamed of those folks when they enter his kingdom. What they face may be tragic. It's terrible. We pray against it. We should fight against it to help them. But even if they face death, their reward in heaven is infinitely greater than what they faced on life. If that's true for them, then how much for us here in a relatively safe country where we're definitely free to practice our faith how much more do we need to be out there doing what God has called us to do this brings us to our main idea this morning you want to write this down if you forget everything else shame on you <laughs> but, but this might help r remind you of some of the other things we talked about and it's that we need to be people who trade instant losses for eternal gains every day when we're following Jesus. If you want to get rid of that nagging fear of missing out, then just accept that you're going to miss out if you're following Jesus. That's just going to happen. I can get rid of the irrational fear right now by telling you it's not irrational. You're just going to mess up. You're going to miss out. You're going to miss out. But if following Jesus is the goal, if denying yourself and your will is, the, is how you start, then you will 
as the, the day, every day begins, you will trade in those instant losses and you will see them as not even important because you're getting these eternal gains, this reward in heaven. Jesus made it clear when he was talking to the crowds who truly misses out and who does not. And so let's commit to deny ourselves, to keep our focus on the goal of heaven in our lives and to follow Jesus in whatever he calls us to do. When he's calling us to cut sin out of our lives, when he's calling us to share our faith boldly, when he's calling us to to serve in ministry, when he's calling us to give, whatever he's calling us to do, it's contributing to the life he has picked for you. So don't waste your time on the distractions. Do what he's called you to do.